Welcome to Northeast Wildlife DNA Lab. Thank you, Nicole. It's so nice for you to take some time with us, and I want to introduce you to our viewers. Um, we are joined with Nicole Chinisi, who is the laboratory director, and I, and I wrote this down just to make sure that I got it right, Northeast Wildlife DNA Laboratory. And um, very, very important service that you're providing for us locally and for across Pennsylvania. So I thank you so much, and we're specifically going to focus on Lyme disease and tick-borne illnesses today, which are we are number one in Pennsylvania with this concern and health crisis. So I think you're gonna learn a lot, the viewers watching today, uh, about this, this concern and a little bit of information that hopefully will help you out if you do have a tick or see a tick or know anybody that has, uh, you know, wants to have a tick tested as well. So. How did this laboratory come about? So we started in 2005 under a grant from the National Institute of Justice and we actually started doing wildlife forensics work, which we still do. We still work with the Game Commission very closely doing forensics. And then in 2008, we had a lot of students that 2007, 2008, looking into Lyme disease because that's when it was really kind of getting large and we were increasing in cases in Pennsylvania. Amazing. And so, so like 10 years ago, you think? Yeah, so it was 10 years ago. Um, yes. These students were going out collecting ticks and mice and they were testing them and then we just developed these molecular assays to be able to detect the DNA of these pathogens. Um, and since we've been offering the service to the public. Um, and so... It's amazing you think yeah. back to, thank goodness, they started that. Yes. And it's amazing, unfortunately, how in certain ways it's grown the need for it, but the tremendous amount of work and accomplishment that you have done with this laboratory. So uh, we're going to have a, a great details that we're going to talk about as far as um, what we're dealing with. But um, what do we have around us here is the beginning. It's sort of <laughs> neat when you walk into the laboratory because we have all the science. There's science, a lot of science out here, but we have more of the, the lab in the back. Yes. But um, what's out here and what is this? So this is a lot of, well first, this over here, which um, you viewers can see are over 85 the student theses dating back to 1988. Wow. So student research projects, um, master's thesis, that were done here at the laboratory under Dr. Jane Huffman, um, and they're continuing to go. And then over here, That's we have amazing. reference samples for forensics. We have various different fur bear, raccoon, otters, um, beaver back here, samples going across, um, skulls of bears and different things that we use for forensics comparisons, measurements and things like that, um, as well as just some information for the public when they come in um, that they can gather with tick testing and how to protect yourselves. Um, and just some fun pictures with working with cubs and how we collect our samples for different research yeah, we, projects. We have, we have one here that has a, a large size tick on top of it, which is sort of neat um, to see, but I'm sure at least it brings the attention right away yes. to when you're coming in. And um, well, this is a nice, easy location. It's right off of Route 80, right on 447. And um, it's just amazing the work that you're doing. So I thank you for your dedication. Thank you for coming in today. And um, we are going to head back to the lab yes. where we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about Lyme disease and tick-borne illnesses. So let's head back. Yeah, let's go. So Nicole, we're here in the lab, and this is where everything happens as far as the diagnosis, so to speak, of the tick. But um, there's so much that we can tell the viewers, and it's almost to where to start is, let's just talk about the tick itself. Um, the different types of ticks that are out there, what we're mostly concerned with, and I know we have a little bit of a visual of the size of ticks, because when ticks are on you, um, sometimes you will find them lodged on you and you can identify that a tick's been on you, or sometimes a tick will just fall off on its own. Um, and so, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, because you were the one who's really the expert on this, but um, let's talk a little bit about the, the types of ticks and, and what people need to look for. Okay, so we have three most common ticks in Pennsylvania. We have the black-legged, or also known as a deer tick, the American dog tick, and the third one is a lone star tick, which is, as, is not as common as the first two. They are seasonal dependent, so you will find kind of an array of all three of them in the spring. In the fall, we mainly are seeing the deer tick. The deer tick is the smallest of the three. 
and that's the one that's going to transmit Lyme disease, which is the most concern in Pennsylvania. We have in certain areas greater than 50% of ticks infected with Lyme disease. Um, the dog tick is actually going to be associated with different pathogens like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which we do also have cases in Pennsylvania of that, even though it's Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, you think Midwest, right, but title, right. it act more common in the Northeast. Um, the deer tick also is associated with other pathogens like anaplasmosis and babesiosis, which have been found in approximately 10% of ticks across PA, and also the Powassan virus, which can make things very complicated in diagnosis because if you're treating for Lyme disease and you have a co-infection with PWAS and you're not going to treat a virus with antibiotics. Right. Um, so those are the three common ticks and they do have different life stages. So a nymphal tick, which is the juvenile stage, it's, there's larval ticks, which is baby, not really tech associated with too many pathogens. A nymphal tick's middle juvenile stage, very tiny, size about a poppy seed. And then the adult ticks, and you, they could be sexually mature at that point, so you have female and males. And the females will be associated with the transmission of disease. And I have... Yeah, right behind you. And this, this is something that you showed me in our initial meeting, um, which we'll go into legislation later, but... This is a large cartoon of what a deer tick would look like, but essentially you're looking for black legs, brown body, black shield with the adult tick. Um, and then here we have this size. So a sesame is about the size of what your adult female would look like. And the little poppy seeds in there are be the size of a nymphal stage right. tick. Right. Um, and it becomes very challenging with seeing them because as they burrow into your body, you only see a portion of the actual nymph tick. Right, right. And so they could um, enlarge but they could also fall off, correct? Or no, yeah, so point. they will feed up to five to 10 days depending on the life stage. And once they get to their full blood meal, they'll just fall off. And sometimes you may not happen to see them, especially the nymphal ticks. A lot of, 50% of people don't recall right. seeing a tick and Because they're so tick. small. Yeah. I mean, when you look at that and you look at the size of a poppy seed, it's, it's amazing yes. that you would find that, and especially if it would be in the hair line or someplace Difficult where areas where the it's back or something that you see. can't see. So um, with that, that's a little bit of just a, a basics of the tick world and the different types of ticks we're looking at. But Pennsylvania is one of the highest um, or is the highest, I believe, currently with Lyme disease. And that's only what is actually noted and recorded. Yes. Um, so it's really the number is actually very shy of, of what probably what's out there because a lot of people are, un, are not diagnosed yet or they haven't even realized that that's, that's what they're dealing with. Um, so the concept that we're talking about a lot and you in the lab here are talking a lot about is testing the tick rather than the person. Um, so there's been a lot of conversation about the inaccuracy for those watching for the Lyme disease test. So oftentimes people will get Lyme disease tests done and they'll be negative, they'll be negative. There, there's a time frame where, the, let, let's talk a little bit about that because I think in the medical world, it appears from, from my, my level and my education is that there's still so much unknown about Lyme disease. And so when we say Lyme disease, we're talking about one pathogen technically. So we'll, we'll get into the pathogens and try to keep it as, as easy, I think, because once you start talking about what's inside this wonderful tick, <laughs> and what it could then, once it attaches to you, what it can transmit, is it gets a little messy for people. It gets yes. hard for people to follow. So, so let's think about the, the tick and what's inside the tick and that when it lodges onto you, what it, what it can give over to you. So, um, but, but there's a lot of unknowns with, with yes. doctors and, and diagnosing patients and we're trying to get better with, um, I'm trying to create legislation here that will uh, create continuing education for doctors on Lyme disease and tick-borne illnesses, um, which are the extended pathogens, that will help them be better prepared to understand how it affects each patient differently. And so we're working on that right now. It's one of my efforts. But um, so talk a little bit about that, what's in the tick and why if and the, and the negative results of a Lyme disease test too. So I guess I'm asking you two prong. Okay. Let's start with the, the Lyme disease testing and sometimes the negative results and, and how that works. Okay, so in human testing, in order for you to have the best accurate analysis through your blood, it's a immunological, so it's looking at your immune system responding to the bacteria. And in order for you to have an accurate result, you would have to wait for at least four weeks after exposure to a tick bite to allow your immune system to build up that 
what would be considered or in the result a teeter, high enough level so that you it are detected a, a positive, correct. Right. Um, so that's four weeks after exposure, and you really want to be treated for Lyme disease prior to 28 days of it after exposure. So that's in that window of you should already be treated if you're already symptomatic. Before it could affect the body. Yeah, so de early detection is extremely important with Lyme disease. If not, long-term effects can create neurological, cardiac issues. Um, so we're leaning towards the tick analysis. It's more accurate. Um, it's 99% accurate. We're looking to see if the tick has DNA of any of these pathogens. So it's an extremely sensitive um, analysis. And once we get the tick in our lab, we can have your results within 48 hours. So it's extremely fast. So if you get bit on a Monday and you bring it into our lab, drop it off on Monday, you can have your results by as early as Wednesday. Yeah, which is amazing. So you talk about the effects and how fast something can affect your body. And even if it's in your body and it lays dormant for a while and then comes out later on, but, but testing it you know, as soon as possible. So it's getting ahead of it yes. so that you really don't have to worry about whether the test that you get, the Lyme test is accurate or not accurate. And you don't have to wait that four weeks. That's right. And even right. after four weeks. Even then sometimes the tests are negative too, It's only about 68% right? accurate. Right. Um, and it's just because of the antibody switching. So IgM versus IgG, IgM's expressed first and then it transfers into IgG. IgG. So depending on when that test occurs, and the activity of your um, infection right. too will change. Right, and I think that's what makes it very difficult for the doctors too, because you know they're, they're looking and trying to figure out how it affects each person differently, and depending on the pathogens or whatever else it may be, that how would they recognize it, and especially yes. if 68% if accuracy, you said? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's tough. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of false negatives, yep. you know, and now it, the, false positives at all usually or are you as what you know of do you I don't hear as many false positives as, as I do false, the false negatives. negatives right which can make people sort of check it off and say well I don't have Lyme in that in that term um, but maybe they could still be dealing with it and because every patient doesn't present the same yes they they doctors are having a hard time saying well this is the Lyme patient this is the Lyme patient and it's because they don't look the same yeah and it goes hard too because not everyone gets the bullseye rash right and it's not always a classic bullseye rash, what everyone's looking for. Um, only 50% of people that are exposed to Lyme disease will get that bullseye rash. So now you have a, you're flipping a coin. Um, right, and that's what you hear all yeah. the time. You hear all the time, well, I didn't have a bullseye rash. So it's kind of like dismiss. Yeah. Don't worry about it. And, and that was great to say, hey, listen, this is a sign, but it's not the it's telltale sign of anymore. everything and anything. And then it complicates it even more if there's a co-infection. So if it's Lyme disease, along with something else, it's expressed differently and the person will express different symptoms. And, and not every tick-borne pathogen has a human test for it right now, right. which also becomes very challenging. Right, right. So, talked a little bit about the testing, but so now that's the testing in the human. The testing in the tick, and, and East Stroudsburg University and your laboratory here, the number one which I don't think a lot of people know, and we're trying to bring some attention to also in recognition at the legislative F level that East Strasburg University is the number one tick testing location for Pennsylvania. So there's so many people that sends, we just left the National Park Service, and they send anybody that gets a tick on them, it's, it comes here. So, but it's coming from all over Pennsylvania, right? Yes, we get ticks across Pennsylvania, and even outside of Pennsylvania, people will come to us for tick testing. Um, we have a lot of partnerships with National Park Services, um, DCNR, the Game Commission, um, other state agencies as well, and in school systems. Individual in school gets a tick, they all bring they it to us. Um, so we've been testing ticks since as early as 2008, and since then we have expanded and increased our capacity and our sensitivity on our assays. So we now can detect down to one spirochete, which is the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. So it's very sensitive and accurate. Yeah, which is amazing. And it's, it's good that you're such a great resource. Um, it's terrible that it's growing in the yes. fact of the need for making sure that, you know, these ticks are tested and people know what they're dealing with. So when someone in the public, mother has a child that has a tick on them, and so besides all the contracts that you have and all the resources that you have, the, the mother comes in with the tick. And we've talked about this before, but I just want the viewers to know. We've, 
the mother comes in with a tick and says, okay, I want this to be tested. They walk right in your front door? Yes. Okay, so go through the process with me for that. So if you have a tick and you pull off a tick, you, even if you're not sure if it's a tick, you can always, it's free identification and we also can determine your risk, um, meaning we can tell how long the tick's been attached to you. And that's all free. You can just stop in. We're open Monday through Friday, 9 to 4.30, and we can go through what you're exposed to and we can cover everything that um, is at chance and at risk um, with that tick. So we'll identify it as you come in. We'll identify it. We'll check the engorgement. We'll go down the list of things that you should be concerned of, depending on that. And how long. Um, and then if you would like it tested, it is a fee to do that, um, but we can determine within 48 hours up to 16 different pathogens that that tick can be right. carrying. Right, so you can choose to do the, the one main pathogen that's Lyme, and then you can choose to do an extended pathogen, which is a little bit more of a cost, but an extended pathogen for other other pathogens that are in the tick that yes. maybe are not as common, but are still you can still see them in Pennsylvania. Yes. Okay. So with that too, I, I think what happens if on the weekends somebody finds a tick and obviously you're Monday through Friday, they put it in a bag. They can mail it to us too. Okay. So you can always mail it to us if you can't get in during our office hours. Um, we are actually working on getting a drop box system oh. going out front. So if it is after hours in the evening, um, to benefit everyone who's a working person. You just drop it off in there. Uh, you can download our form from offline and you can check if you just want the identification at first, just check it off. When we get in, we take it, we'll identify it and we'll call you, let you know. Same thing as if you were walking in and then you can do payment over the phone or you can, again, drop it off payment. Wait, that's pretty interesting. So where do they go for the address and all of that for mailing it? On our website, which is esu.edu slash DNA lab, and hopefully you can post that That's underneath right. the we'll video. That's right, we'll post that for them now. Um, once you click on there, right on the top, it says tick submission form. You can click on there and download it. You print it off, and our address is on there. And then just pop the tick in a plastic bag, put pop, it in, and that's yep, it. place your tick in a plastic bag. So that's pretty interesting. In. So until you get a drop box, it's, that's, that's an option yeah. to, to mail it as well. But if not to, they can pop in on Monday yep. you know, and, and hold on to the tick and bring it in. So that's that's a good useful information I think for people and how do I get there and so the Innovation Center too for people that don't know where the Innovation Center we always know where it is yeah. we, we refer and we know where you are but um, you're right on 447 right off the Marshalls Creek exit off of 80 and you make a left on 447 the East Strasburg Innovation Center building is right on the left hand side it's right across the street from the Days Inn and from the State Bridge um, suites so it's a very easy location right off of 80, but, um, and right here in the heart of East Strasburg University. Yep. So let's continue a little bit about the most common Lyme pathogen. And then you mentioned a few in the beginning of your discussion with me on some of the other pathogens that are being found inside of the tick. Okay, so Lyme disease is the most common. It's the one you hear about the most often, and yes, Pennsylvania is the leading state for Lyme disease cases, and we actually make up more than 35% of the total cases in the United States. Mm -hmm. So we have a large amount of Lyme disease cases. Um, other than Lyme disease, though, you have what's called anaplasmosis. It's a white blood cell infection, and it is found in about five to 10% of ticks, depending on your location. In addition to that, there's I'm not gonna stop there. I know. Babesiosis, which is a red blood cell one. infection, yes. and babesiosis actually mimics malaria. So it seems like you have a malaria-like infection, but it cannot be treated with antibiotics. So if you have a co-infection with babesiosis, you may be getting better with the Lyme, but you're just not seeing, you're still fatigued. It causes um, issues with breathing because it's red blood cell infection, so it's hard to keep oxygen within those red blood cells. Um, and then if you don't want to stop there, we have viral, we have Powassan virus in Pennsylvania and there have been a couple of confirmed cases this year um, and that transmits from in 15 minutes of a tick bite. Wow. So, wow. Yes. So very strong. Yes. And yeah, so, so these are the things I think the extension of Lyme, tick-borne illnesses is really the wording that we're trying to do the show to educate people on the high health crisis Yes. that we have, which I think people know, but how really strong it is in Pennsylvania and how it's really changing and mimicking a lot of different disease states as well. So with that, Nicole, we're gonna take a quick break and we'll be right back with the legislature. <laughs>
Did you know that Act 16 of 1999 honors one of the greatest leaders in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives? The Matthew J. Ryan Legislative Office Building, once known as the Capitol Annex, is located next to the main Capitol building and honors the late Speaker of the House, Matthew J. Ryan. Those who visit this building will observe the magnificent architectural designs providing eloquence and grandeur to the building. Known as one of the greatest members in the history of the Pennsylvania State House, Matthew Ryan started his career in the legislature in 1963 and was elected Speaker in 1981. His charisma and knowledge will forever be reflected in the building now named after this great legislative leader. Now you know. Did you know that Violet Oakley was the first female artist to receive a large commission for artwork done in a United States Capitol building? In 1902, Joseph Houston, designer and architect for the 3rd Harrisburg Capitol building, commissioned Violet Oakley to paint murals for the governor's reception room. He believed that Oakley's contribution would add interest to the building and act as an encouragement of women of the state. Prior to beginning her work for the Capitol, Oakley set out to England to conduct research for her murals. Upon return, she decided to center her artwork on William Penn and the founding of Pennsylvania. Oakley made sure that Penn's ideals of justice and peace could be seen throughout her work. In 1906, she completed 13 murals titled The Founding of the State of Liberty Spiritual and was placed in sequential order around the governor's reception room. These murals were some of the first to be installed in the Capitol. When Edwin Austin Abbey, another artist for the Capitol, died in 1911, Oakley was offered another opportunity to create murals for the unfinished Senate and Supreme Court chambers. Her work on the Senate murals, including International Understanding, was completed by 1919. Oakley then completed the Supreme Court murals, including the Divine Law, by 1927. Oakley is said to be the principal artist for the Capitol, with a total of 43 murals on display. She remains one of the greatest muralists in the United States. Now you know. Welcome back to the Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Rosemary Brown, and I'm with Nicole Chinisi, who is a laboratory director at East Stroudsburg University. And uh, we are discussing Lyme testing, tick-borne illness testing um, on ticks, and then also just an overall conversation about the disease state. So, Nicole, thank you so much. We were having a little bit of fun um, when we took a break here with, with our, our models, but we have our tick here. And, and, and go on this a little bit, because we, we we're talking about how serious this really is. So this is a nice stuffed animal version of what's called the spirochete that causes Lyme disease bacteria. Um, it is bacteria, but it has this corkscrew-like structure um, and what it is, is it basically just screws through your body, through your tissues, and it's extremely fast. And it is actually 10 times faster than our fastest cell in our body, which is our white blood cell. And for all of you that don't know what the white blood cell does, it's part of the immune system. So it is what responds to your, an infection Biting in your bo body. So when you're exposed to a foreign object, for instance, this bacteria, your immune system recognizes it and it responds and it creates that immune response in your fever and your chills and that's what you get. Well, since it's so fast, our body can actually go undetecting it for weeks before you even know you've been exposed. Mm -hmm. And it's just because of its spirochete structure. Ten Very times interesting and I think that keeps it simple for people to understand like how, how that happens and and how the body can hide it for so long. Yeah. And that's why it could be sometimes years, right? Before somebody- Months, yes. Months, years, I mean, you know, so you hear a lot of different people with, you know, I didn't know and I was struggling to try to diagnose what it was. So, but we did, so, so it's interesting how it's changing and evolving in many ways. And with that, um, a couple months ago, I was here for the launch of um, the Cutter Lyme disease tick test that yes. has been, um, launched out here but but you can talk a little bit about this because it's interesting again talking about the different pathogens and testing that can be done both here and then also this can be picked up in the store as well yeah so this is a preventative and a type of diagnostic test that you can use so these are available in some of our big box stores and in our area i know that a couple of um, the true values and Dwayne. Uh, not Dwayne Reed's, uh, CVS, CVS in Marshalls Creek carries them, um, Dunkel Burgers. So they're $25, it's all inclusive, it includes your Lyme disease test. Inside you have a tweezer, um, a pre-addressed 
sticker that you put on your envelope and a little baggie with the tick ID number and you mail it in. So for $25 you can get um, your tick tested and this is just for Lyme disease so for other pathogens you can add on as well anytime. Um, but it's a better method to target people in the market with $25. It offers them the service and you can buy a couple of them. We have the medicine cabinet and your travel kit a little bit harder for a tackle box or a hunting kit. Um, and you just keep them in your glove compartment and for $25 if you need them and you have a tick you just put it in here it's already prepaid just send it out to us once we receive it 72 hours guaranteed you'll have your results right so that's great so that's really getting ahead of it and being prepared yes and then um, it's it's if you can't walk in you can't get here to the to the laboratory and, and you want to take care of it. CVS is open 24-7, I believe. Right. So, hey, listen, it's great. Yeah. It's great. So, so this is something new that has never been out. And you can see the health crisis in Pennsylvania that these ticks are starting to be such a great concern for people. So it's, it's a great alternative um, to help people get that tested. So the other, the other fact that we often talk about is we are getting a little bit, uh, the show goes so fast, is prevention and keeping ticks off of you which is difficult when there's so many and we want to be outside and enjoy the outside, enjoy the Poconos and the beautiful area that we have. But you are doing a lot of work with that as well to help yes. the, the, the children, the community. So talk a little bit about that for me. So we are at East Stroudsburg University, myself and actually my coworker who is my research assistant, are going around to um, with the Department of Health and it, with PA Lyme Resource Network with a CDC block grant um, and we're giving educational workshops to different groups. So outdoor workers, construction workers, linemen. Um, actually, Wednesday I was out at the Monroe County Garden Club giving nice. them a, a wow. preventative. And so we just cover what you can do to still enjoy what you do outside, whether it's fishing, hunting, gardening, hiking with your animals. Um, it goes over prevention, what sprays you can use, natural, chemical, how to apply them, how, what to wear, what to look for. Um, the symptoms of all the pathogens. So it really is an extensive program um, and it can be geared towards any group. So we're actually working to do a Boy Scout group um, in a couple of weeks right? and cover right. all of that. So if, if somebody was interested in having you do a group or have some of the other people that are also trained to do those programs, they could contact you here as well? They can contact myself um, or they can do info at palime.org and send them a little bit of a request and if not, call us and we'll forward them to the information. That's great, that's great. So this was a very quick show, a very quick informational on pay attention, know that this is definitely, Pennsylvania is number one in Lyme disease. Um, there are some other concerns with additional uh, pathogens starting to show up and um, really make sure that you're paying attention when you're outdoors and if you do find a tick to try to get ahead of it um, because this is the best way to know what you're dealing with um, rather than waiting for the test on the human body. So it's, it's again, it's another sort of, sort of pseudo prevention. Correct. So there's the first line prevention of not getting the tick on you and then there's the prevention of if you have the tick, if you're lucky enough to have the tick and see the tick, um, this is the next defense of prevention. And then the last one would be, you know, there's no tick and you have to get tested as a normal yes. blood test or whatever else it may be. So um, I hope that we brought some awareness and um, some information to people and they've gotten to know what a great resource East Strasburg Uni University is, not only locally, but to the full state of Pennsylvania and how lucky we are to have you doing the work you. that you're doing. So Nicole, thank you so very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And so thank you for watching the legislative report. If you have any questions regarding this show or any other state related matter, please feel free to contact my office.